All right, you guys are awesome. Thanks for being here. My name is Danny Rivers, and I'm one of the pastors here at LifePoint. Hey, listen, I know you just heard this, but this coming weekend, uh, we're adding a Saturday gathering. We're going to do this for a season. Uh, we're, not, we're, not, we're not committing it to uh, until Jesus comes, unless he comes on this Saturday, and then we'll be ready, and it'll be awesome. Uh, but we're going to do it for a while, uh, just because we want to make room, and particularly in this gathering. Um, the first gathering looks a lot like this one. And the third one's a little bit smaller than this, but this one is the, the one where people who are checking us out for the first time often come. And if that's you today, by the way, welcome and thank you so, so much for being here. Um, and we always want to make sure we have room for new people to check us out. So uh, if this is home for you, we'd love it if you would consider coming to the Saturday night um, and then serving at one of the three other gatherings that we do on, su- on Sundays. It would mean so much to us, especially this week, just to help us get this one started off right. And uh, we'll see how this goes, and we'll hang on to it and as long as we need to. And uh, the hope for me is that we can continue to grow and, and, and keep the rooms uh, as safe as possible and that we don't have to add a fifth one. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I'm a little exhausted by the time it's all over as it is, but uh, it'll be good. It'll be good. Um, so... Five. And in your chairs there, there's some little invite cards if you want to hand that to a neighbor or a friend. This is an easy one, you guys. I promise you this is an easy one. It's free popcorn and free stuff. And, and one of the, I don't know, the most um, captivating ways that we preach around here is through this kind of a series. So we'd love for you to bring folks out. So today, if you haven't been here, I want to catch you up real quick, as quickly as I, I can. And it's all important for everything we're going to say today. Uh, we, we read to you on week one and week two from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 27. I'm not going to read it for you. I'm going to summarize for you. And, it just, and the essence of it is that everything, when, when the end of time is coming, the Bible talks about the end of the day, it calls it the day of the Lord. When that is approaching, um, the writer of Hebrews says that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. In, in other words, every system of man made for man by men, like, and so think about all the systems, the politics, the uh, economical systems, the, all, all of them created by man for man will get shaken up uh, to the extent that some of them will just, just be, will cease to exist. And we've seen that. I think, I think you can't look around at our country right now and our economics, our government, the, everything, there's a lot of shaking going on. And, and so then Jesus comes along and, and he teaches and he says, hey, when the day of the Lord is approaching, when the last days are coming, he says, um, the love of many will grow cold. And I want, I want to explain it to you. So he would say that people who were fired up for God at one point in their lives, um, they'll, they'll not be fired up anymore. He says that some people will lose their way. And, and then he says, and there will be false prophets, people who come along, and, and, and it's not false religions that necessarily that they're creating, it is philosophies of man, worldviews, we talked about this last week, that point people away from the living God, right? So we think false prophets means churches, false religions. Yes, but more importantly, most importantly, most relevant to us today is the philosophies of the world that would say, you don't need God, you need this. Okay, you with me? And, and, then, and then, so what we saw over the last 18 months in America, in the American church, I should say, and there's all this data that points this out, is that around 32 to 33 percent of American Christians in the in the year 2020 just kind of walked away from faith for whatever reason, um, just walked away like I don't want anything to do with church, I don't want anything to do with God, and 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 so they lost their way, they lost their footing when crisis came, when trouble came, health, economics, politics, all of that conspired together, and they were just like done. So what Jesus said would happen, what the writer of Hebrews said is ha- would happen happen is happening it's happening so the good news is that verse 28 says that that those of us who are planted in the house of God those of us that have that have put our hope and our faith our trust in Jesus he's we are part of an unshakable kingdom amen somebody that like you know it don't matter how much shaking is happening around this kingdom will not be shaken that's the problem. And so, so how do we have roots? That's the series, how do we have roots? And we've been teaching from Psalm 92. I want to show this to you real quick. This is a psalm, a song for the Sabbath day. So when you read, those of you new to the, to the Bible, when you read a collection called the Psalms, that's the songbook for Israel during a season of time, a, a, an extended period of time. So this is a song to be sung on the Sabbath day, and it happens to be about the Sabbath day, God's house. Verse 12, the righteous... We'll say this with me. We'll flourish like a palm tree, strong, right? They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. 
iconic tree known for its height, known for its uh, endurance, like its strength that they, they grow for centuries, and grow like a cedar of Lebanon. And then verse 13 uh, says how, how, the, how they will grow and flourish. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will, say it with me again, they will flourish in the courts of our God. Verse 14 says that they will bear fruit even when they're old. They, they'll stay fresh and green, meaning it doesn't matter how old you are, God has a plan, God has a, a, an idea for you. He wants to put you to work and he wants to keep you active and growing. Amen, somebody? So we talked about this word planted, uh, which is the key, right, to the text. Planted in, infers that there is some soil involved. And we talked about how it's, it's not so important what the seed is. The seed will reproduce after its own kind. We learned that in Genesis. Apple seed creates apple trees, pear trees. We got one out here if you want to go grab some because they're driving us nuts because the hogs are coming to eat them. There's plenty there if you want them. Take 12. All right. One for each day of the 12 days of Christmas because um, pears are relevant at Christmas for whatever reason, right? Every other time it's like there's a pear there, um, right? It reproduces after its own kind. So the seed is never the problem. It's the soil. So Jesus comes along, Matthew 13. He tells a story, a parable, and he's got seven of them in this one chapter about the kingdom of God. Up there, comes down here, your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. Up there, down here, right? It's the whole goal of Jesus, to bring, bring the rule and reign of God throughout the world. And so he's telling a story about this sower, a farmer, who goes out and starts throwing seeds. He's casting seeds. And he says that, that the seeds, he, he tells us later, are the word of God, is the word of God. The seeds are the word of God, uh, which is important for all of us because that's what we do in here, right? And, and then he says, and some of them fell on hard ground. And then the birds came along and just ate them up. And the ground was hard because it was a path. And people had walked all over it, right? Important thing to know. The second thing is, is the kind of ground that, that had some soil, but it was a rocky. It was a lot of rocks, like, like San Antonio. Can I get an amen on some rocks, right? Like it sprung up, but the sun came down, choked, it burned it up. And then he says the third kind of soil is the soil that had, it, it had soil, but there were so many thorns involved. Um, and then he said the fourth soil is good soil. It's the kind of soil where the hardened ground from having people walk over us and hurt us and harm us has been tilled up by God. The Spirit of God works. The, the thorns have been dealt with. They've been cut back. They've been cut away. They've been dealt with. The, the rocks have been taken away uh, in life. And, and that kind of ground, which, by the way, the soil represents our hearts. Right? That's, that's what the whole parable is about, our own hearts. And by the way, we, get, we have control of our own hearts because it doesn't matter what's been done to us. God can help us. God can set us free. Our hurts and our habits and our hangups of the past can all be dealt with by, by God and his people. Amen, somebody? So it, it matters that we control that part of our life. And so, so he says, the psalmist says that the best type of soil to have is, is going to be found in the house of the Lord because there you're going to flourish in the courts of our God. Now, I want to talk to you today about financial roots. We talked about generational roots last week. By the way, if you missed last week and you have a family, um, I hate to say this because it sounds self-serving because I preached it, but I, I think you're going to find that it will be super helpful for you to raise people, your kids in the house of the Lord. Um, the, the, the parable of the sower, which we've referenced in, in every message in the series, is very uh, interesting because of the descriptions that Jesus gives on later after he describes the soil, he goes, now let me tell you what all this means. He does it later, though, way down in the text. And, and so in verse 22, here's what he says. He says, the seed falling among the thorns refers to somebody who hears the word, but the, say this with me, the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it what? If something is deceitful, we found this out. Some of you found this out about your last boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever, right? If something is deceitful, it will let you down when it, you need it most. Yes or no? Right? It will not fulfill its promises to you. Right? That's true about sometimes about people, and sometimes it's true about money as well. It, it does not deliver Oftentimes, even when we get it, even when we hit the number we think we want to have, it does not deliver what we think it will. So Jesus says it's 
the deceptiveness or the deceitfulness of wealth. It doesn't give us safety that we think we're going to have. It doesn't give us the security that we we think we're going to have. And and it doesn't give us the satisfaction that we think we'll get. And some of you are like, well, could I just try and see if it does, right? (laughs) I'm with you. I I feel you, right? Matter of fact, Solomon says, Solomon the wise says in, in, in Proverbs chapter 11, he says, those who, what? Trust. Underline that in your Bible if you have your word out. Those who trust in their riches will fall. And guys, over the last 11, 12, 13 years, have we seen the rise and fall of so many very, very wealthy people? Yes or no, right? Right? And a lot of us are like, like I'd still like to fall from a high place, right? <laughs> they trust in their riches will fall. But the righteous, those who put their trust in, because how, how does somebody become righteous, by, by the way, somebody? The righteousness of Christ is put on your heart when you, when you trust Jesus, right? Corinthians says that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the righteous, the people who trust Jesus will thrive like a green leaf. There's that word again, thrive, flourish. Deceit, that, that's a lie, right? And listen, when the worries of this life, which are, we're going to find out in just a second, which are often about money, uh, and, and the lie that money can be more than money can be, when, when, they, when, when, they, when, when it takes root in our heart, in the soil of our heart, it chokes out the word, making the word of God and fruitful. We've been talking about roots, about bearing fruit even at our old age, but the soil is the key, not the seed. The seed will always reproduce after its own kind. So when the word of God comes to you, it will reproduce in your life what it is. But if it falls on bad ground, it cannot reproduce what's, what, what it is. You, were you with me? Right? So if the soul of our hearts, as it relates specifically to money and financial things, if it's thorny, meaning we don't want to hear it, we don't want to talk about it, why do we, why are we got to talk about it at church? The word of God will get choked out. It will not reproduce what it's meant to reproduce in your life. And then we will be standing on our own when it comes to financial matters and, and our future as it relates to finances. And so, so t- Paul comes on along later. He's, re- he's, re- he's reiterating what Jesus said uh, in, that p- in that parable. He says, Timothy, for the love of money. Everybody say the love of money. Anything wrong with money, everybody? No. Do you wish you had more? Yes. Right? But for the love of money is what? A, so a lot of times we say the, there's more than one. Come on, (laughs) y'all. But the love of money is a root, we're talking about roots, a root of all kinds of evil. So when we think about money and evil, we think about like, like, like greedy corporations and we think about like drug traffickers and, and, and human traffickers. They're evil and they're making money off of evil things. But listen, listen. There, is, there, there are other kinds of evil that can come about with a love of money that are not so obvious, that can be insidious, and this is what Paul's going to talk about. He says, some people eager for money, and he's talking about believers, by the way, because he's writing to Timothy about his own church. Some people eager for money have what? Wandered from the faith. Do you remember what we've been talking about for the last three weeks? People have got, it's shaken. They, they've lost their way. Some people eager for money have lost, have wandered from the faith and what? Pierced themselves with many griefs. What, what, we have been talking about people who didn't have roots. And so when trouble came, economic, health, all kinds of crises, w- when it came, what did they do? They wandered from the faith. The word was choked out and then notice, and then they, they pierced themselves. We pierce ourselves with sharp things, Right? Uh, Colin's up here tonight today playing guitar for us. Colin's the one that smiles all the time. We love Colin, right? But he comes up to me today and he's like, I cut myself, man. Because he, uh, he wanted to be uh, like me and carry a knife. And uh, no, he wanted to carry a knife, not like me. He just wanted to have a knife. And he poked, he's like, I cut myself, man. Cut myself. Cut me real deep, Shrek. You cut me real deep. Uh, donkey the wise. Um, that's in uh, First uh, Donkey chapter 2. We pierce our things with things that are sharp, like thorns. Now check, stay, stay with me now. But how are people piercing themselves? In, in our day and age, how are they piercing themselves? What are the thorns that Jesus talked about that will choke out the word that Paul says will? I love the word that he uses. He could have used any word, but he uses pierced. He, he knows what Jesus said about this. So, so 
I, I showed you this at the beginning of the year. A couple of d- uh, data points real quick if we can. The average American's financial picture, this is from the Federal Reserve um, and GoBankingRates.com and one other place that I forgot what it was. So the a- here's a thorn. The average student loan debt is 20 to 25000 So we're starting our careers day one with $25,000 in debt. And the new, the new statistic is that it takes 12 years to pay off only 30% of that. Some of you know, yes or no. Some of you know. You're trying to do it right now. That's a thorn. The average credit card debt in America, this is from 2019, by the way. This is, they didn't have the newest stuff. 6814 and some of you are going, I wish. <laughs> That's it? What, what are we doing wrong? The average auto loan is $32,000 or $1.32 trillion in outstanding loans. But look at this next data point. The average household income is $57,000. So if you have $57,000 coming in and you have a $32,000 car, do the math. That's not good math, y'all. That's not good. Oh, no, but I can afford the payments. Ah, can you? Anyways, it's a thorn. It's a thorn. Uh, that's not a thorn. You can't help that sometimes. The other parts are a thorn. But the average savings... In somebody's savings account, their retirement account, 34% of Americans have zero. And 69% have less than 10,000. So three quarters of the country, less than 10,000. Retirement, right? we got to retire someday. This is a thorn. 64% have less than $10,000 in retirement funds. And 46% of Americans have zero. Is there any more? Yeah. 58% of Americans say that their personal debt will keep them from reaching their goals. More than half. It's probably more than that. 76% 76% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, meaning they have no emergency funds so that if, if, bad, if the washer goes out, the refrigerator breaks down, the engine goes out, toast. The credit card debt's going up higher, yes or no? These are thorns. But, but here's the thing. This is all math, right? N- not having enough money in the bank is more than a mathematical problem, yes or no? Because a lack of savings will create stress And those of you here in the health profession, you know how devastating stress is to Americans right now. Because stress creates depression and anxiety and a lack of focus and strained relationships and insomnia and substance abuse. And Paul says people wander from the faith because of money issues. And so we have to deal with the thorns, everybody. Remember, it's about your soil. Can you flourish in the house of God? It depends on the soil. Right? And if the soil is thorny because of mistakes that we've made in the past, we have to deal with the thorns. But listen, sometimes it's not the mistakes we've made, it's just that life happened to us. And so you're like, Danny, what do I do? Well, we gotta have a plan, and we're gonna get there in just a second. But but it's not just the thorns, it's the worries of life, he says. It's just not the, it's not just the deceitfulness of wealth, it's the it's the worries of life. The number one thing that Americans are worried about without it's not even close, our finances. Let me give you a couple stats. According to the American Psychological Association, 75% of Americans are worried about money all the time. I read about another recent survey that said 25% of people's number one dominating thought throughout every day is money or the lack thereof. The same exact survey said that, that the top three financial worries that people have, remember we're talking about the worries of life. Jesus says the worries of life choke out the word that create thorns in our life that choke out the word. So, so the number one worry is living paycheck to paycheck. Meaning if, if I lose my job even for a second, I'm done. The, the number two is the, uh, uh, the fear of living in debt forever, meaning we can't get out of this debt, and so we keep adding to it, and we know we'll never pay it off, which means that our kids are going to inherit our debts. And then thirdly is the fear of never being able to retire. Like i got to work until I die. Like on my last breath, I'm like, Could I just be at Walmart saying hello to somebody at the front door and get one more check, right? Jesus says the worry, the worries of this life, number one of which is is money, and the deceitfulness of wealth, can you see how they're both tied together? Is going to choke out the word of God, and he says it's going to make you unfruitful, you're not going to flourish, you're not going to grow. We, we can get all the other stuff right. We get this wrong. We still, we have thorns and it won't grow. There's only one kind of soil that produces flourishing and, 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 and growth. 
good soil. Rocks have been dealt with. Thorns have been cut down. The hard places have been tilled up. Yes? So th this is important um, because we have to do things God's way. God has a plan, and we have to do things God's way. We cannot flourish if our finances are all jacked up. Yes or no, right? If you want financial stability in life, if you want roots, you're going to have to go God's way. And that's the point. Will you do things God's way or will you continue to do things your way? Will I do things God's way? And we've said this in every service, every sermon. There, there are huge problems in our world financially, especially in America, because people refuse to trust God and take him at his word. And the great thing is God's plan, if you read the Bible, is about giving you financial peace. Not necessarily making you rich, although some people will, right? Uh, um, it, it's about God caring for you and God... Uh, taking care of you financially when you trust him. Now, these are all promises. There are all these promises in God's word related to finances. So many, by the way. But I would say that, like, the vast majority of them have with them a, a caveat. The promises do. It, it would be like an if-then caveat. In other words, like, God would say, if you do this, then I will do that. Right? Right? You trust me, do what I ask you to do, I'll go the extra mile for you. We're talking about flourishing, we're talking about growing, we're talking about roots in the house of God. And, and think about this, money is such an important topic in the Bible that it's the main subject of nearly half of the parables that Jesus told. Half of the stories that he creates, half of them are about money and possessions. In addition, one in every seven verses in the New Testament, which is that second half of the Bible, one in every seven verses are about money and possessions. One in every seven. The Bible offers 500 verses on prayer. Woo, that's pretty awesome. Fewer, a little bit fewer than 500 verses on faith. 2,000 ver verses on money. Why? Let me ask you something. If there are those of you who are in this room today who are parents and you are being crushed and you are being pierced and, and you are being squashed and crushed under the weight of, of, of your financial situation, do you want your kids to grow up and, and have to deal with the same stuff? Yeah, right? No. So God is your father. God is my loving, gracious father. Love me so much that he sent Jesus to die on my behalf. And the last thing he wants is his people, his children, to get pierced and to get crushed because he knows there is such a connection between our faith and our finances. Such a connection. And if you're a loving father, you want to, avoid, you want to help your kids avoid. And, and here's the thing, and I'll say this from my own personal experience and from talking to so many of you about this. Let me, let me just give you this real quickly. No one who applies what Jesus said about money to their personal finances ever regrets it. Now, I didn't get an amen, and that's okay. But there are many of you who said, I'm going to trust God, I'm going to try it God's way, and you would testify, I'll never regret doing it God's way. You're like, well, I tried it that one week. No. It's, it's about time, y'all. It's about time. And it's about time we deal with the thorns. Come on, I just had to throw that in there. <sighs> Next line here. We say this all the time. Following Jesus will make your life better and make you better at life, including your financial life. So for many of us, our relationships, yeah, our relationships with money and possessions has to change because the problem in America is we have, an, we, we, there is an assumption that everything we have is for our consumption. There's an assumption consumption. I like it. I'm going to say it again some other time. Um, our, 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 our perspectives about money need to change. Our priorities about where money goes needs to change. And our patterns that a lot of us inherited from our families of origin have to, to change. And so Jesus comes along and he wants to help us. This is why there's so much emphasis on this because it has so much to do with the quality of your own life. And, the, and your ability to receive God's word in your life and flourish and grow. So Jesus comes along and he teaches this. This is in Matthew 6. He says, no one can serve two masters. I, either you will hate the one and love the other or you'll be devoted to the one and you'll despise the other. Now, these are the words of Jesus himself. Paul would say in, in, uh, in, in Galatians chapter 5, he says, listen, 
Uh, I, 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 wanna, I want you to, to walk in the Spirit, right? Galatians 5.22, keep in step with the Spirit, or 5.20, one of those two. Uh, keep in step with the Spirit. And in order to do that, God's going to give you the fruit of the Spirit. And, and the back end of the fruit of the Spirit is this little part of the fruit of the Spirit called self-control. Come on, don't you wish there was a, a vending machine that you could go to and put a quarter in and get some self-control and just be eating that on your way to work? <laughs> Come on, do you need that the next time you're on Amazon Prime? <laughs> yes or no? Come on. I'm preaching to myself now. He says, I want you to walk in the Spirit so that you won't give, you won't give in to your natural instincts, which, of, which is to make life all about you. And he says that God through his spirit, will always nudge you away from what is, what is real in our lives, which is to make life all about us, towards, to, to, to an idea, which is to make, make, make life about other people, to make life about God. And he says, because you cannot, so, so that you don't get mastered by anything, so because you cannot serve two masters. And Jesus goes on and says, you cannot serve both God and the devil, uh, the world. No, he says, Fill it in. He says money. Strange, right? You would think that the, the other kind of master is the enemy. You're, Satan, Lucifer, whatever. You cannot serve both God, and what he's, both God and money. And what he's saying is you cannot serve God and stuff and the chronic pursuit of more than you need. Right? And, and here's the interesting thing. Jesus, with this text, he views, um, he views money and the quest for more, 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 more as the chief competitor for our hearts with, for, with him. Not, not the devil, not the world systems, not the philosophies of the world, but money. And, and what he's driving is, do you have money or does money have you? To which you would shrug and respond, I don't have me. He doesn't have me because I don't have enough of it. Can I get a witness, somebody? Like, I would like to have so much money right, that I, that I have a struggle with it, like trying to master me. Come on, can I get an amen on that? Like if wealth is a difficult test to pass, I'd like to at least sign up and see if I could, right? <laughs> Come on, anybody honest in the room? Like, like I want to try, right? So if it's not us because we don't have enough, according to us, well, who is he talking to? I, I've said this before, but, but it could be that, is it, is it that Jesus is talking to a group of people who... Most every afternoon when you come home from work, you see multiple Amazon boxes sitting on the front porch, and you look at them, and, and they have your name on them, but you don't even know what's in them. Come on, right? And, 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 and we're the one that ordered it, right? It's like Christmas every week. Who's it from? Oh, it's from me, right? W what's in it? I don't know. Could he be talking to us? Right? He's talking to everybody here, and here's why. Because everyone, myself included, is at risk of making money and stuff and the security we think it's going to bring, our ultimate pursuit, our ultimate concern. And when we do that, when we make it our ultimate concern, 75% of Americans do. That's what we just read. That's not a scriptural. That's not a passage of scripture. That's data from the Federal Reserve. 75% do. Right? It means that's become their Lord. Their functional savior, just if I could get all this right, then I would have peace. Then I'd have happiness. Then we'd, we would get along better in a home, and we wouldn't fight so much. And No, no. Jesus does that for you. Amen. Not money. Right. Not, not me, Danny. I serve God. He's the master and Lord of my life. I'd say that too, but here's the deal. I've said this again, but everybody, every one of us leaves a trail, like, like Hansel and Gretel through the woods, right, heading over there. Turns out that's a creepy story, but anyways... Um, you, you read some of those stories and go, oh, what? It's, it's not like candy. It's weird. Anyways, um, everybody leaves a trail of crumbs of, of, our, of our money and of our time and of our energy and of our allegiances. And, our, and, 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 and you follow the trail, not our words, but you follow the trail of, of, of the crumbs that we leave by our life. And every, at the end of the trail is not a little, little cottage. It's, it's a throne. And you don't get to the person's throne by them telling you who's on the throne. You get there by following the, the trail of, of our time and our investments and our loyalties. You follow the breadcrumbs, which are the, the passions that we have and, and the thinking and where the giving is. And when you get to the end of the trail, you find somebody or something sitting on the throne. Some of us are going to get to the end of the trail of our own time and our own emotions. And there's a throne there. And seated on the throne is our education 
or a house or a career or our hobbies, and nothing wrong with any of those, by the way. And some of us would say, this is what's most valuable to me by what I spend, by what I energize, by, by what my allegiances are, what my loyalties are on the throne is, is me or on the throne. But, but we would say, no, 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 who's on the throne is God because that's what I say and that's the songs that I sing, but that's not how you, you ascertain that. Right. It's the trail of crumbs. Now here's the deal, and this is only for people who follow Jesus, right? It's so easy for us to trust Jesus with our sins, It's so easy for us to trust him with our sicknesses. God, please heal me. God, please heal my daughter. We go to the doctor, we get a bad thing. Like, it's like, God, please help him. Don't let him die. It's it's easy for us to trust him with all these things. Um, In fact, most of us have trust Jesus with our entire eternity. We ask him to be the Lord of our lives, to forgive us our sins, to take us to heaven when we die. We're like, Jesus, I'm trusting my entire eternity to you. But isn't it interesting how hard it is for us to trust God with our own money and stuff? Everything else, no problem. But when it comes to our stuff, we're like, mm, I got this. But do you got this? You're welcome for the grammar, right? <laughs> like Jesus says in the verse we just read, he, he, he's like, when it comes to following me and putting me first, don't tell me about your intentions or your feelings or your good thoughts. Show me the, no, nah, he didn't say it like that. He didn't say it like that. <laughs> he never asked anybody to give him any money, never did. It wasn't about him getting money. It's about him getting your heart. It's about him protecting your heart from thorns, from piercings, because he loves you so much. He cares about you so much that he knows the impact that the deceitfulness of wealth and the worries of life can have on you. What can I do to help them get it? Trust me. Trust me. Believe in me. I got you. And this is why he starts Matthew 6, that text we just read, with, hey, give something to the needy. Make sure you're always generous with, your, with the needy. But then he finishes the text, verse 33. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So, so the way to keep the pursuit of other things and to, to avoid getting pierced is not to prioritize money, but to prioritize something else. And so Jesus says, you want to be right? You want to get this right? You want to be free? You want to live a different kind of life? You want to have deep financial roots? You want to you have control over your life? You want, you, want to, you want to have self-control so you don't get in trouble with money or get embarrassed by money or pierce yourself with grief and, and shame? I want you to start getting better at putting God's kingdom up there, down, coming down here first. Make it the first priority of your life. Because God's kingdom is an other first, others first kind of kingdom. But we live in a kind of kingdom where it's me first. And listen to me. And, 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 and he's promising that, that if we'll trust him with this, we'll have more peace and more joy and more purpose and for more fulfillment that will flourish in every way, not just financi- financially, because our, our lives become a means to an end. And the end is not just me and mine. It's about what God is trying to do in the world and the hearts and the lives of people. It's about investing ourselves in things that will last for eternity. So seek first God, seek first God's stuff. And you know he's saying, listen to this right here. I want you to, I'll put this on the screen because I want you to remember it. If you'll make what's most important to me important to you, then I'll make what's important to you important to me. Do you want the great God of heaven making what matters to you matter to him? then you start by making what matters to him matter to you. And you know where this shows up most, honestly? In our pocketbooks. Do you know how I know this is true? Because the rest of the verse, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then look at the rest of this verse. And all these things that you're worried about, that you're fretting about, that you're you're staying up at night about, all these things will be given to you as well. Put, don't, but, it, but don't put you first. Don't put your stuff first. Like, don't put your kingdom first because when we put us first, we eventually come in last. I, I promise you, you live a selfish, selfish life, you will come in last place every single time. And here's why, because you are a created being and you were created to seek first your creator and when this gets out of order, There is crazy disorder in your life and in your heart and in your finances because it's being choked out 
the deceitfulness of wealth, the worries of this life will choke out God's best in your life and you cannot flourish and you cannot grow. You won't be like a palm tree. You won't be like a cedar of Lebanon because you don't accept God's ways. So what do we do quickly? I gotta go super, super fast. How do we have financial roots? Give, save, live. Give a percentage and I think if you read God's word, you're going to find give 10%. That's called the tithe. I don't have time to get into it today, but that's what it is. Give, save, you, you, you assign a percentage to that. I just put this up. This is Andy Stanley, by the way, 10, 10, 80. This is the thing he taught his kids. It's what he's lived by his whole life. I love it. Give 10, save 10. Give, give 10 to where? To the purposes of God, right? Wherever, wherever the eternal purposes of God are being, are being dealt with, give, right? Save, right? And they both work together, by the way. Right, let, me, let me explain it like this. There's got to be a plan for your future. There's got to be a way out. By the way, uh, Dave Ramsey has a, a website called RamseySolutions.com. If you're like, we're struggling with debt, go there. We don't know how to save, go there. There's all these tools. There's, all these, there's so many incredible things. So if you want to know how to do that and you want to know how to live on the rest, go there. But let me just talk about this. What do you give? You give God to to God your first and your best, not your leftovers. Come on, y'all don't like eating leftovers. Why does God want to eat leftovers? Yes or no? Like we always get leftovers and we're like, we're going to eat those. But then we look at them like two weeks later and there's things growing off of them. Should we plant that? (laughs) Stuff growing. Is that mushrooms? Is that a, is that a truffle? (laughs) Can make some money off of that. And we throw it away and it stinks up the garbage until garbage day. Can I get away? The garage smells like death. Give God to the first and the best and then trust him with the rest. And here, here's some couple of principles. You won't flourish. You can't grow or flourish where you don't sow. Why did you pick the neighborhood that you, that you are in? Because your heart's there. Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, your heart will be there also. Why did you go there? The, the schools, the neighborhood, it's safe, it's secure. It's, they have good schools, right? You put your treasure there. You, you don't flourish where you don't sow. You sowed into that neighborhood, you're going to flourish in that neighborhood. Right? This is about a generous spirit. So, so it's a biblical principle. I, I love this, this paraphrase of, of, of Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24, if we can get it. The world of the generous, say this with me, gets larger and larger. Do you want that? The, the world of the stingy gets what? Smaller and smaller. The world's wealthiest people now are trying to give away most of all of their wealth. They're, they're actually signing it up because they realized that, it, that, that I, my, my money is growing larger and larger. My heart was growing smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. The, those who help others are themselves what? Helped. If you want to grow your world larger, help somebody else's world get larger. Amen. Right? You will not grow beyond what you've sown. Everything you need in your life begins as a seed in your house or in your hand. And the sowing of today's seed, this involves investment and savings. The sowing of today's seed is the answer to tomorrow's need in your life. That thing you started putting money aside for 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, compound interest comes, oh, we got a big need. It's there because you sowed it 15 years ago. Because we reap what we sow, yes, but we reap more than we sow, yes, Put a corn of corn in the ground, a stalk comes up, multiple ears with hundreds of kernels, right? But listen, we reap long after we sow. But see, we get impatient, go, I'm gonna sow this thing right now. And then 12 days later, I wonder if it's growing, I need it back again. And then we're going, we'll have a need someday. We, we didn't stick with it. You plant it in the ground, you reap what you sow, you reap more than you sow, you reap long after you sow. It's about investment. I have this little quote I want to put on the screen if you guys, we exist, if you guys got that one. I've been teaching from this, this is Vernon Jordan, he's passed away now, lawyer, activist, but he said this thing that stuck with me. We exist temporarily through what we take, but we live forever through what we give. You want to leave a legacy, you want to leave, you want to have roots, you want to bear, bear fruit that remains. It's not about what we take in life, it's about what we give. And anybody who's lived long enough knows this is true. This is 100% true. Last, last bit. 
I'm going to shut it down in one minute. Jesus is telling a story at one point. This lady comes in. This is in Mark's gospel, Mark 14, 8. I'm sorry. Yeah, Mark 14, 8. 14, 3, sorry. It says, Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of what? Expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. Sounds nasty, whatever nard is, right? She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. It offended a bunch of people that she did this. But look, she came in and she broke a, a, a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume. You know what the difference is between expensive and cheap perfume, other than, other than the fact that they both smell better, right? Right? You wear, by the way, you ever notice how people that like cheap perfume like to wear a lot of it? Can I get away with this? Like, I'm in the elevator. It's like, masks. Where's my mask? Forget COVID right now. I just want to get away from that, you know? It's, it's not really even just about how much it smells. It's about how long it lasts. So you, you put cheap perfume on, cheap cologne on, on your date night. By the time you get to the restaurant, can't even smell it anymore. The expensive kind, though, the next day you wake up and it's, you still smell it. Right. Weeks later, you still smell it. So the good stuff, the expensive stuff lasts. Same with what I offer Jesus. Is it cheap or expensive? I'm not even talking about money. I'm talking about our lives. How do I know? How do I know that what I'm offering Jesus is going la- to last, or, or, or is, is valuable? It's about how long it lasts. Roots that remain. I want to invest in things that will outlast, outlive me. And so Jesus, in response to the, the pushback that he's getting, verse 8, says, she has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of me of time. So she did what she could. She did what she could with what she had. That's all, we, that's all God asks. To do what you can. We talked about this in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Do what you can with what you have. And, and he says, I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached through, throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. Here we are 2,000 years later proving Jesus' point. We can still smell her perfume 2,000 years later. Because she she had an investment mindset. I'm going to give God my first. I'm going to give God my best. I'm going to trust him with the rest. And so many of you are here in this building today because there are a few people here who for the last 13 and a half years since we started this church, people like Mark Garcia, people like Bill English, day one people, my sister Mary Garcia, here on the day when we had our first gatherings in their home, and all these years later, this building, this, this church exists in part because they said yes to the call of God, yes to doing things God's way. And listen, listen, generations of people will be blessed, will receive good things through LifePoint Church because some, some people, started and said, I'm going to sow a seed, and I know I'm not going to reap it right away, but long after, I think any one of them will tell you, I can't believe the blessings of God in my life, what God's done, but, but it started with them breaking open and saying, God, my first, my best is to you, and whatever their legacy is going to be in this life by what they do in this life, Mark's a principal, Bill's a surgeon, whatever they do in this life uh, through, through the end of this world, their greatest legacy, I believe, will be Life Point Church. And the people whose hearts and lives have been changed because of it. Not because of me, but because of what God does whenever people say yes to, to, me, to him. Put me first. I'll tr- put me first with your first, your best. Trust me with the rest. I'll come through for you every time. Amen. Father, thank you in the name of Jesus for just this opportunity, God, to share the word of the Lord. I pray that the ground of our hearts, God, which may have wanted to sort of reject any of this, would just, we, would just, we would just ask ourselves why. Why do I feel this uh, in me? God, why? I, I think it's an important thing. Because it, this is not about anybody taking something from you. This is about what God has for you. Not what God wants from you, but what God wants for you. And God, what, what God wants to protect you from. And I just pray over every heart and every life, God, that we would trust, that we would, we would see a financial counselor if we need to, that we would go talk to somebody who's wise in this area. We go to this website, RamseySolution.com, whatever, whatever it takes. Lord, let us come to, 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 to have financial fruit and roots that remain. I pray blessings and grace and courage and strength over these people to trust you with the first and the best. I pray your blessings over them. If, 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 if any of them are grieving right now, they've been pierced with many sorrows because of financial things, I pray, God, some of us, we honestly just need to repent. 
It's a matter of repentance, God. Forgive me, Lord, for making life all about me. God, help us. And because here's the good thing, when we do that, you, you instantly forgive us, God, and you want to put us on the, the right path, and the good shepherd will lead us and guide us along the right path. Help us, I pray, to start today by getting on the right path in Jesus' name. Blessings and flourishing on every person here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, everybody. Amen. God bless you. We got to get out. We got to get out of here. Hey, real quick, real quick. Don't forget, next Saturday, 5 o'clock, be here. Help us be here. Uh, if you want to give, lifeonessay.com out there. Hey, if you made a decision today to follow Jesus, get a book on the way out, Following Jesus. We want to put that in your hands. Have an amazing day, everybody. Shake hands, bump fists. Half of you are standing, half of you are sitting. You can all stand now if you want to, or you can just chill out right there. God bless you. Have an amazing day, everybody. We love you. Have a great one. <laughs>